Hi everyone. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story and how I reclaim my creativity. Two years ago, uh, I had this moment that changed my life. It was a January afternoon with snowy weather, just like today, and uh, I slipped on the icy sidewalk only to sort of bump my head into the sidewalk. And when I got up, I saw these wooden shipping pallets. Uh, which I don't know where they came from, and I didn't know who dumped them there, but I know their destiny was to come home with me that night. <laughs> <coughs> this is what eventually became of them. The process of transforming the pallets into this table, uh, I had to acquire new skills. I had to learn how to use a screwdriver, which I had never used before. In sort of uh, finding a new beginning for these pallets and making a table from them, I felt this joy, this pride. And I felt that everything and anything was suddenly possible. So I have a hard time making choices. Uh, making choices is saying yes to something, but it also means you're saying no to something else, right? Uh, and when I was in school, I felt I could have it all. As I got older, I, like you, felt I had to make all these choices. Should I study engineering? Should I go to art school, become a teacher, or maybe skip higher education altogether? I found these choices overwhelming. And so I ended up studying, every, studying everything. <laughs> uh, I wanted to eat ideas. And uh, yeah, I was um, yeah, literally studying everything. I ended up at business school. Um, a degree from business school, people told me, would give me all the opportunities uh, in the world, sort of. Um, so, graduating five years later, it seemed ironic to me that I didn't feel I have any opportunities whatsoever. Because, see, I had a degree, but I like, lacked ideas and dreams about my future. Uh, throughout my eight-year stint at university, <laughs> Uh, I had lost uh, something important along the way. I had lost my own creative spark, and um, the world seemed sort of drained of color. Uh, the transition into the real world outside of a university was not a smooth one. In looking for a job, I didn't find anything sort of uh, anything remotely close to what I'd seen for myself. I wanted to stay close to ideas and to cultivate my curiosity. Uh, and uh, like uh, everybody, I applied for a couple of positions, but only like, like everybody, I was rejected a few times. Uh, and this crippled my confidence. And instead of continuing my quest for a meaningful purpose in life, like most normal people, uh, I sort of gave up on this idea altogether. I went to see a therapist at the time, and she gave me homework, applying for jobs. I, who had three degrees, couldn't bear adapting to the real world and do this very basic thing. At one point, she suggested I just take a job at the local supermarket. And there's nothing wrong with working at a supermarket, but somehow this was not the, the destiny I had envisioned for myself. So there I was, overeducated unable to make choices and move forward. And spelling it out to you, I felt like a loser. I felt ashamed uh, in the face of others, of course, but then again, people I could avoid. Looking myself in the mirror was a whole other story. But then again, for a while there, I avoided that too. I was broken and I needed fixing and I needed it real bad. Some time passed, and I still felt stuck, unable to sort of fix my situation. Then along came this random slip that, on that sidewalk that January day, a couple of years later, and the moment that turned my life around. <laughs> Making this very basic table out of two pallets ignited this creative energy inside of me. I felt struck by lightning. I felt nothing else mattered. I had fallen head over heels in love with the empowering nature of do-it-yourself. And from not seeing an opportunity anywhere in my future, 
I found opportunity waiting for me on every street corner. Where others saw scrap and sort of common urban leftovers, I saw potential. I saw opportunity. I found that making stuff uh, in my head, I developed this kind of design thinking. This is a sort of do-it-yourself thinking. It was about deconstructing stuff. And when I see, saw a chair I liked, for example, I instantly started analyzing how I could make this chair myself. This way of thinking allowed me to be a little bit of everything. Part engineer, part artist, part designer, and so on. With this new practical confidence, I connected scrap I saw on the street with the sign I saw in shops and restaurants and other places. I found myself thinking that making cool stuff wasn't so hard. In tapping into this design thinking, it made me sort of reverse engineer a lot of the sign I saw. I snapped out of passive design admiration, and this was very empowering. Back home, new projects pop, seem to pop out of nowhere. Of course, I was constantly busy building something, and I stopped watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, where was I going with all of this? I had no idea. But it felt good, and I felt the urge to continue searching somehow. I felt I started building something that I needed to finish. And while building, uh, the academic in me uh, tried to make sense of this whole process. Uh, what could I call this work I was up to? Was it about me making furniture? Was it art? Was it sort of weird hormones and a nesting? Or was it just a meltdown of some sort? <laughs> uh, and so I went back to the books and all the knowledge I'd acquired at university, only, not, only to find I couldn't relate to anything. I, I, I didn't find anything in these books I could relate to. Uh, and I also uh, read an embarrassing amount of self-help books at the time. <laughs> um, so in trying to finding out who I was in this new space and understand these new kind of processes inside of me, I turned to the internet. And it, it turned out uh, I wasn't alone. There were people like me out there. <laughs> <laughs> they called themselves hackers. They were passionate am amateurs like myself, uh, uh, very eager to explore new ways of, of uh, building and reshaping things around them. Uh, hacking was about a an holistic approach to creativity. And these hackers had nothing to do with cybercrime. Uh, basically, it was just about modifying objects around us uh, to suit, uh, suit your own needs. To this concept, I could relate. I too modified stuff. And in identifying myself as a hacker, uh, I could unite my different areas of interests. Uh, and uh, I suddenly found this space where I could have a little bit of everything, like I had at university. And by combining the process of hacking that I've come to love, uh, and the stuff that was close to me, scrap, I found this new uh, word um, uh, to describe my new passion, scrap hacking. And in combining these two words, I could now call myself a scrap hacker. I call my project scrap hacks, and this process I was up to all the time, I could now refer to as uh, scrap hacking. And labeling this process was a way for me to uh, connect to something outside of myself and uh, make sense of what I was doing. <laughs> uh, I found this unknown concept and I felt eager to explain, explore and develop it. For me, this scrap hacking was about more than making cool stuff out of old palettes. It was about rethinking, repurposing and reshaping neglected resources, including myself. It was about creative reclaiming, and it was about me reclaiming my creativity. I also came to realize that not only was scrap hacking a lot of fun, but it was also a sustainable solution to a common problem, as local materials, scrap, overseen resources, like on every street corner, could be uh, hacked into cool stuff, and that I could have a global community of hackers uh, helping me find cool ways to do this. 
So uh, about a year ago, uh, uh, a year into these hacking processes, I started a blog. Uh, it was uh, initially about me sharing my palette hacks to anyone interesting. Um, and after a while I got this vision of creating this hub for everyday do-it-yourself discovery, showing how everyday stuff could be hacked into awesome new creations. And in this process, I also became allergic to fancy, expensive design, as I saw how design ideas could be so much more useful if the design blueprints were more openly shared. In doing this work, I, I discovered the do-it-yourself blogosphere. They, it blew me away, and I was completely humbled by the genius crowd out there. It quickly became clear that I was nowhere near as talented as the crafty, crafty sort of mega geniuses out there. <laughs> uh, but I was curious, eager to learn and explore this sort of pool of do-it-yourself discovery. And so there were a lot of pictures circulating on the internet, and I felt this need to organize them somehow. I wanted to b make my blog uh, motivational, not only inspirational, because I wanted people to snap out of that sort of passive consuming of uh, sort of interior design magazines that are very inspirational but very rarely actually inspire hands-on uh, real-world action. I wanted the blog to like knock from inside the screen and say, this is doable, you can do this. And so I made the blog this canvas of creative expression, not only my own but mostly of other amateur designers and their amazing creations. I started writing blog posts and making collages on different themes uh, with overseen resources as this red thread. It could be about forgotten living room corners, of what to make from broken china, how you could hack plastic straws, how you can make lamps out of branches, and how you can hack uh, milk containers, use bundling techniques, Reuse drawers. Make cool stuff out of these wood stumps. And how to sort of make two tables from one table. And how to hack an old dingy t-shirt. <laughs> and by searching the internet for ideas uh, on these themes, I felt I wanted to reach this space of time, uh, of a space, by gathering projects that could be from all around the world. Maybe that woman is in Czechoslovakia, and maybe that other girl is in Canada, who knows? Uh, I wanted to gather projects in one single picture. And uh, I wanted to be this sort of visual tour guide of the do-it-yourself blogosphere. I wanted the images to spark do-it-yourself action, from Dalarna in Sweden to Delhi in India. And through the internet, I found these sparks of creative expression flying around everywhere. I wanted to gather them in one place. Uh, and the ideas I, I, I saw coming from this sort of diverse crowd of ordinary people, from ordinary life, I felt I could relate to these stories. And, and after a while having the blog, I also felt that in a way they could relate to my vision. And today I'm very humbled to host a creative um, conversation with over 15,000 people uh, that have connected to Scrapbacker on Facebook. Um, in this process, I became very critical to the idea that creativity is something uh, residing in singular creative geniuses. Studying art history was very much about the one-man show, about reading about Picasso and his life and all the events that shaped him. <laughs> him. And uh, I found absolutely everything was wrong with that notion of the one-man show. Uh, creativity was not about the singling, singular suffering geniuses. It was not all about men. It wasn't about fancy galleries, uh, museums, uh, and uh, or about these sort of chosen creative uh, tokens of creativity, like uh, chosen few. And I found that creativity had to be reclaimed. And I think that in this network world we're living in, we no longer have to reduce this complex phenomenon of, com of creativity to be about a few people. Because I think technology has restricted us before because we've only had like, books can only be that thick. So we have reduced um, uh, sort of the, uh, how we understand creativity, when in fact it's so much more complex and networked. Mm -hmm. 
I think that uh, we are ready to embrace creativity for what it is. Uh, a collaborative group effort. Uh, I truly believe that the crowd is the genius of today. Their stories empowered my own and made me believe in my imaginative powers and putting them to practical use. I'm so glad I slipped on a nice sidewalk. I'm so glad I brought those pallets with me that night because this changed me and it was the start of a creative journey. I started fixing stuff, and I ended up fixing myself. In defining myself as a hacker, I reclaimed my creativity. Uh, the crowd helped me glue the bits together, and succeeded where eight years of education and a couple of years of therapy had failed. <laughs> I be truly believe that small hacks are the gateways of bigger ones, and that great things have humble beginnings. I feel it's super urgent that we reclaim creativity as individuals and as a group, and that we recognize that creativity is about all of us, everywhere, every day. It's not about cramming it into one perfect job, like I was looking for graduating from uh, business school. It's not this choice you have to make. It's a new way of seeing uh, and re rethinking, reshaping yourself and the world around you. Thank you. <laughs> mm.